that I chat with Keith O'Brien over at Page One. It's an Amazon full service brand management agency. And the conversation is super interesting because Page One is actually an entire pivot from a business that was running well and successful only to be shut down by Amazon. And we talk a lot about that. I mean, Keith has a super interesting and storied history in building, growing businesses, uh, in some cases, having them cut from underneath them. And we have a really candid conversation about some of the things that don't go to plan. Seems to be a bit of trend at the moment uh, in the conversations I'm having sort of sharing the truth behind the fact that all these incredible stories that you see, nothing's linear. So here's another really good example of what it takes and what you need to really have your business survive in today's day and age. Welcome to Successful Scales, the show where I talk to world-class professionals on what it takes to scale successful businesses. I dive deep asking questions to people who are running unicorn businesses, to raising funds, to buying businesses, mergers and acquisitions, IP and patent law, what is to manage performance management. I mean, the list goes on. The idea really is how do I create knowledge and learning for you guys listening in? And of course, myself getting the floor with people who I, in many cases, would never dream to share a room with. Before we jump into the episode, I've got to give a special thank you to our sponsors. Firstly, over at Global Wide Advisors, a leading digital consumer products investment bank focused on optimizing the sales process. An incredible team, always happy to pick up the phone and educate you or anyone about the sales process and what you should really consider and can obviously help take you to market or even acquire businesses. I ring them for just about everything these days. Us over at Multiply Me, we are the end-to-end executive search and HR function into the Philippines, helping find better talent and onboarding them effectively. And last but not least, Escala, our management consultancy focused on process improvement, where we help build better systems for your business. That's all the ads you're going to get from me, ladies and gentlemen. The rest is all about learning. I hope you really enjoy and get as much out of these sessions as I do sitting face to face with some of the world renowned leaders in their respective fields, asking them the tough questions that they're not often asked. Keith, welcome to an episode of Successful Scales, my friend. Thanks for having me, man. Appreciate it. Yeah, no, I'm excited to dig in. You know, we've just had a great 20 minute chat, which we didn't hit record, but I think anyone who would have been listening probably would have seen some value in that. But before we jump in, mate, as I ask all of my guests, I would rather not fuck up explaining your history and have you tell it yourself so that it actually sounds impressive before I butcher it. So, Without further ado, mate, I'd love you to tell everyone a little bit about yourself and uh, everything sure. that uh, has led you to this point. Cool. Um, yeah, I know I win the the best Zoom background award. Hands plain, down. Plain color wall. Um, uh, look, I, I so I guess, you know, just keeping it on uh, in the Amazon world, right? In e-commerce. No, no, t- let's, uh, let's go way back. I mean, here's the thing. Oh, geez. It, here's the thing, right? When, when you look at, you know, your entrepreneurial journey or what's led you to Amazon, I think a lot of people misconceive the fact that like everything started a whole lot longer, you know, like it wasn't, yeah, yeah. it wasn't the last three years, the last five years that defined you and led you on this journey. So sure. don't, don't deprive us. Tell me everything. All right. Cool. So, uh, I guess my entrepreneurial kind of arc, so to speak, um, I left, I dropped out of college when I was 20 and uh, went into network marketing full time. Uh, And uh, that was, I just got like, uh, like so many people do, right? Like, you know, you get, uh, you get uh, enamored by the, by the dream. And, you know, I had, uh, you know, the catalyst for that was, you know, my, I watched my father, my father was uh, like a, Manuf- uh, manager of like a manufacturing company, right? They made uh, back in the day when like printed circuit boards and uh, different components that went into all kinds of different electronics um, products. Uh, 
Uh, I, my dad is like the, the, the most even kill chill guy. Like I've never met my dad. I literally don't think I've ever heard my father say a bad word about anybody in my entire life. And I've never really met anyone that, that didn't like him. He's just a likable guy. Um, and except for one guy. So my father left uh, a company in Pennsylvania where I was born, took a job with a competitor in Chicago uh, worked his way up through that company and then took a promotion down to a border town in Texas. And my father ran a, what's called a maquiladora. He'd go across the border to Mexico every day. Uh, they'd manufacture there, ship across the U.S. and distribute. Um, and then that division of the company got sold. And the guy who bought it was the same guy he quit from Pennsylvania. Oh, this is 20 odd, 20 odd years later. So my dad was like in his early fifties and he got laid off. This guy still didn't still had a grudge and, you know, very all political. My dad had increased, you know, the production at this plant by like 400% over five years, you know, all the things you do. So I was already kind of having that entrepreneurial bug. And then that catalyst combined with the timing was like, I right, forget it. I'm, I'm leaving school. I'm not going to work for anybody else. Um, now, all that did for me, I did spend two years and I went seriously in debt. I was like 35 grand in debt by the time I was like 22, right? Which is a wake up call uh, and you grow up really fast. Um, but anyway, you know, it, it took me a couple of years to kind of, I took sales jobs, get back on track, started my next business at 23, 24, and that one did well. So I was really immersed in like the personal transformational arena. So we sold courses and seminars um, to consumers and that that business did very well. Um, I then kind of took a break. I started, uh, I took that, you know, uh, that leadership development ideas and I created a, actually a charitable organization. Um, and I was going into middle schools, high schools and colleges and teaching kids, you know, inside out leadership development, right? So trying to really kind of helping them figure out who they wanted to be as they figured out what they wanted to do in life. Um, and uh, so I did that for uh, almost a decade. We worked with about 12,000 kids. Um, and at the end, we were doing teacher training and uh, adult civic leader programs and things like that. But I walked from that agency, from that, uh, that charity in when, 2000 or something like that anyway um and was just kind of consulting and bouncing around and doing odd stuff and um and then in 2014 a good friend of mine fellow australian uh adam hudson uh started uh started selling on on amazon then started came up with this idea for a company that ended up being named i love to review it was the first independent product review company in the amazon space and then I loved the idea and I was like uh, director of business development at a digital agency at the time. I hated it. Um, and uh, that was the first job I had, I had taken in 20 odd years. Right. And I was like, this sucks. And so I opened up a Fort Lauderdale office for I Love to Review. And then a few months later, I took over the company as CEO um, and we grew that up to, you know, a couple million dollar a year run rate um, and we're growing double digits month over month until Amazon changed the TOS and we shut it down in 2016. Um, so realistically, wow. we just wow. looked on. Yeah. So that was the journey, right? And um, we morphed into the agency after that. And we basically knew we we're going to stay in the industry. And um, there's a lot more to that time of transition that was really very, very, very challenging. Um, like after I loved to review, we had a lot of clients that prepaid us. And we were no longer able to provide the service. So um, it was a, it really was an amazing time. It was very tough, Yoni. We had some clients that we had helped make so much money. They basically said, hey, are you going to stay in the industry? And I said, yeah, of course. And they're like, okay, just hold on to our money. Whatever you guys do next, we'll, we want it. And I mean, that was, it was like, that was amazing. But we also, not everyone was like that. We also refunded. Uh, about $110,000 over three or four months of which was brutal. Yeah, that would brutal. be, that would yeah. be, that's really kicking you while you're down. Jeez. It was freaking devastating, man. And uh, so anyway, you know, 
Uh, this is now almost five years later. Page One's a full service agency. Um, you do from brand management and advertising management through to project based stuff and, and all the creatives and copy. So, I mean, firstly, Page One makes a whole lot more sense to me now than it did five minutes ago. Uh, so I'm glad that you went all the way back and you sort of shared that with me because you also yeah. You also went through a lot of interesting things from my perspective and things that, um, you know, I've, I've had to deal with partially, but I mean, you know, when you talk about, I love to review and that sort of a, a challenge and a pivot, I mean, you, you can, you can really look at that in two, two ways, right? I mean, for some people, that's like the straw that breaks the camel's back and it's sure. like, fuck this, you know, this is so much work to have to deal. I'm paying all this money out. Now I have to figure out not only what I do to, you know, totally have to pivot my business, but, you know, it's just, it's a lot. It's a lot to do with. I mean, I, the whole idea of successful scales is about helping to grow businesses. And I think that I feel like most people I'm speaking to now, you know, I'm actually getting into the shit that doesn't work because it's so easy to glorify and, you know, create these situations where look, look how good I am. I've built this business, multi-million dollars, yada, 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 all this stuff, eight figures, 10 billion figures. But the reality is like none of these journeys are linear. So I yeah. mean, I, I would love to hear what that was like. Like how did, how did you get shut down for I Love to Review? And like, what was that? What was that like? I mean, I've been called up before where uh, an a Amazon business that I grew to 5 million a week and a half before, just to, just to put it all out there. A week and a half before Christmas, uh, we got kicked out of Amazon for review, manip review manipulation. I managed to get us back online uh, within within about four hours, which is wild, and that's a story for another time. But we did nine hundred thousand dollars over the next uh, over the next ten days, and that was the profit for the year. Like with that out, that yeah. totally changed the whole trajectory of the business. So I understand yeah. acutely what it feels like to be put up against it. I mean, what was that like for you? Yeah, it you know, look, it's it's you know, and I've got a I got a couple of years on, on you. I turned fifty this year, right? So we just dated the I know, I know, I don't look I don't look it. You don't look you don't um, look it. You don't look a day so over thirty five. <laughs> I don't look a day over forty eight, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, so uh, that I love the review was actually the fourth business that I built to seven figures that had the freaking uh, legs kicked out from under it. Um, and uh, it doesn't necessarily make it any easier, but it was, it was really an interesting time. I mean, uh, and by interesting, I mean, it sucked. Right. So we were like the, the, the policy had just changed, right? October 6, 2016. It's like, I, I'll remember that day forever, right? So the policy had just changed. The big players in the space were, were us that I love to review, Snag Shout, um, I, Greg Mercer with, uh, with Jungle Scout, they had launched Review Kick. Um, AMZ Tracker was big, but they didn't, they, uh, they didn't do a lot of uh, public stuff. Um, I'm trying to think of who else. Oh, and, and viral launch, right? I mean, I mean, even though they weren't necessarily doing reviews, they were the, the, the other big one in space. So we were all booked in to a, to a, a live webinar with CPC strategy with Pat Petrillo as the host, right? This was back before they got acquired by Elite SEM and they changed over to change the name to Tenuti. So um, they used to have the most prolific, you know, content marketing strategy of anybody in the space and probably still do. But um, anyway, so we were due to be on, you know, this podcast, let's call it a Thursday. We get this email from Amazon Legal on Monday, I think it was, or even maybe the previous Friday. And honestly, my first, you know, reaction was I thought it was a competitor. I thought it was, you know, bullshit, right? Um, cause it was like info at Amazon legal, blah, 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 something.com. Right. So it took us like, I, we, you know, we went after and like, I went and consulted with experts on email authentication. Like we were trying to authenticate it. Right. Um, and then finally started talking to other people and, uh, all these people got the same email. Right. 
Um, and the part that that really there was two things because we knew we could pivot, but our our name was was really against terms of service, right? So great name until it wasn't, right? And then um, so the but the part that of the email and I was now corresponding with the legal team like over the course of the next four or five days and getting all these things verified and clear of what could or couldn't be done. And uh, um, ultimately, the part that had to do it for us was that, you know, if you continue with the service as you've been doing it, uh, you're putting yourself and all of your clients' accounts at risk. And I'm like, we, we never did that. Like, we were always, we were, like, we almost made, got made fun of because we were so white hat, right? Like, we had a, we built a firewall between our clients and our reviewers. Nobody could talk to them. We, we built the whole company basically just like buying. Um, and we were getting such good performance only at the, at the end, we were like at a 93, 94% review rate, which was astronomically higher than anyone else in the space. Right. Um, so anyway, so that was the, that was the period of time. And, and because of our name, we just, we said, look, we've got to shut this version of the business down and we'll come back alive under a new name, new, new direction with basically with what we knew, right? We kind of sat down, okay, how, how can we serve this space? Um, and we had basically been giving away optimization strategies for free for two years because they made our, re our campaigns work better. You know, we could put anyone on page one in two weeks with 250 reviews, you know, but most of them back then, they didn't know how to do anything. You know, they didn't know how to do keyword research, copy images, so we just were giving out all this free advice so that the, 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 you'd stick the landing on the campaign. Yeah, no, that, that's, I mean, that's probably the smartest way to go about pivoting, right? It's looking at what assets do I have, what still remains right. to be true, and how can I actually drive forward? I mean, you know, it, it pains me to hear this story and the fact that that's the fourth time you've had to, to go through it. Um, I'll save it for another. I'll, I'll save it for another conversation because you know people who listen to the podcast regularly have heard me talk about it as recently as last week's episode that was released. But I was a partner in Amazon business. Uh, it sold for two and a half million dollars. I saw none of that, and you know, Oof. yeah. So I walked away and started Multiply Me and Escala the same day that I walked away from that business. And you know, there's a whole. Uh, you know what? It's not about me today. It's about you and it's about what you can help right. educate people. But I'll tell you about it when we when we chat next, just not to bore everyone who, who might have listened to it. But um, I, I was really interested um, to hear sort of how that progression went. So you've obviously been hit with the fact that, you know, cease and desist or you're risking your client accounts. You've built this sure. incredible goodwill and you're doing all these ancillary services that, you know, for you is like, well, this is like the side hustle because it helps impact the business. Then it became the business. How did you sort of approach, and for a lot of people who are looking to build businesses, right? I mean, the pivot, that's a scary, scary consideration. Like, you know, doesn't often or doesn't always happen as abruptly as that, where you're forced to make a decision on yeah. what direction looks like. But how do you, how did you approach sort of that rebuild phase? So you found, you know, the niche that you could do. Obviously, page one today has creative solutions, if I'm not mistaken, and you're doing media buying now as well, and probably a whole lot yeah. of other things that I'm not even aware of. Um, you know, how did that sort of, how did, how did that start to build momentum and become the business that it is today? Yeah. Well, this, the short version of the story is that we did. So when we took a step back, said, okay, look, you know, over the last couple of years, we had, we had a thousand plus clients that I love to review. We had literally helped people generate, you know, tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars. Right. Um, and you know, we saw the same, like we saw what most sellers challenges were like beyond, you know, driving a campaign to get them, get them ranked, uh, just the core fundamentals of the business. Right. So, um, you know, back then there, the, I think the only keyword tool in the market was merchant words. Um, yep. and, uh, you know, 
whether, you know, who, regardless of whether you're a fan or not, I think when they first started, they were pulling stuff, you know, keywords from Google. Um, you know, maybe that's not true. I don't know. I haven't. Anyway, so we said, all right, well, the first thing we said is, is like my background before that was all in like, like I learned direct response copywriting in my early 20s. Um, uh, and so that's kind of the, the knowledge I brought to the table, like, you know, like, okay, how do we, nobody was talking about any of this stuff back then, right? So there were, you know, uh, people weren't talking about how to optimize copy or any of that. So anyway, um, we said, all right, where, wh where can we serve the marketplace? You know, what do we know? Well, what can we bet? be become best in class at and uh so at the time there was there was some people that were teaching like content optimization but there really wasn't a lot of people selling it right so um so we launched that service first um shortly after i built our first internal keyword tool uh you know we found ourselves like we were you know we were using like three or four or five different tools because none of them were at the time this is you know, almost five years ago, none of them were very good, right? So we just said, I, so I hired a developer who is now a, the CTO at actually at Zon Guru. Um, and we, we built out um, our first internal keyword tool and it was great. So we had this kind of internal knowledge base. Uh, we hired, I hired copywriters in house. We built a team around them of, of uh, outsourced copywriters all us based and we still do that today we have a, a team in-house that is over the optimization content optimization and then we have a small army of, of us based outsourced um uh, company writers some of which have worked with us for four years right um you know soccer moms and students and you know this kind of thing so um we built that first we started we were you know, we'd do 50, 60, 70 content, you know, uh, optimizations a month. Uh, about six months later, we bolted on uh, a photography and design team. Uh, and then maybe six months after that, we started building our managed services team with advertising. Um, and then about six months after that, we started the full brand management team. So it was a kind of a natural evolution. And we just, we built it we're almost like reverse most agencies. You know, we started with individual services and built it into the managed services. So that is one of our unique parts. We do all of that, all of the work in-house. Uh, our last service to launch, we uh, launched video uh, production um, just a couple of months ago. So literally all the pieces inside of Amazon, we do in-house. Uh, yeah, fascinating. Yeah. And, I, and I think that... Um... I think that yeah, definitely a different approach to sort of seeing it built out. When you when you were going down this direction, right? You've pivoted. You're, you're building this direction. Was there was there a vision around sort of what the company would entail, or was it like you know here's an opportunity, like then we can add this value, like this is value creation, this is value creation, and then before you know it, you've created a full service agency. What was what is what was your mantra? I'd like to say it was more the first, but it was definitely more the second. Um, and like, we just, like we started photography and design because we thought most of the work that we saw was shit, right? And so, uh, you know, this was back when people were still taking photos with their iPhones, right? Um, and so we just saw a need in the, in the space. I didn't know anything about photography. I knew how to tell someone what I wanted an image stack to look like, right? But this is based on like my direct response background, right? You know, I want I wanted this to look like this. I want to handle this potential objection here. I want to handle, you know, I want to nail the benefits here. I mean, back then, I mean, everyone was just selling features, right? It wasn't even a people, nobody was teaching like how to do emotional based connection on in e-commerce. So I saw that as uh you know, not just an opportunity, but something that I was passionate about, like that talk. I mean, I did a presentation on CRO for Amazon like three years ago. I mean, I had, at the time, I'd never even heard of anyone re refer to it like that, right? So, you know, it kind of was both. It was like, all right, what would be fun? What would be really valuable? What do we think we could do really, really well in the space? Um, 
Uh, and that's really how it, how it, how it started. And ironically, our photography and design team, like today, I'd put them up against anybody. They're just freaking good. But it took us two years to really figure it out from a business standpoint. I almost just killed the entire department and stepped away. Well, Create is hard. Creative's really hard. It's super hard. It's also super hard. It's also hard because unlike PPC, let's say, where you know it's very okay. This was my investment. This was my ROAS right. or whatever, whatever metric tacos you want to leverage. This is the direct relationship. Whereas there is what's good for the product listing and optimization, and what you know the CRO and what the yeah. experience actually entails. And then you've got a client on the other end who has a gut feel that this probably makes sense. And that's, you know, we, I was saying to you before, like, yeah, I could talk to you about, you know, the, the painstaking experiences that I've had over a decade in agency land. And for me, like, mate, more power to you. I don't know that I could go back into that uh, service delivery model. Cause I mean, I'm, still got my hair and i i honestly think the only reason why is that i got out of the the agency game so more power to you but yeah i mean like when you when you talk about managing hey, expectations i definitely said it at more than one occasion that i would never own an agency so you know it's it's a funny thing right but uh yeah it's an interesting business you know it's not without its challenges and and uh, uh but you know it, it's I love working with entrepreneurs, right? And you know, to be to be a part of someone else's business growth is is a cool thing. Um, and uh, because I know what that means, right? I mean, we're now working with you know somewhat larger clients, but still, you know, I uh, I love being a catalyst for for growth. You know? and, and I think as well, I mean, you know, getting to know you a little bit now and and the conversations we've had as well. When you when you run an agency, you know it's very much about the relationships that you build and foster, and how you can add more value into that versus you know the end product. To be honest, I'm stealing this from. Do you know Better AMS Taylor at Better AMS? Sure. That, so sure. I I heard him talk about the differences between selling a product and between being a service provider, and it really resonated with me. It's like. I also love building relationships and I love supporting other businesses and I love working through that process and going through it. Um, I think that just when we talk about agencies, there's that added layer of stress that's involved because sure. there's, a, there's a lot of different moving pieces. But when you talk about building the brands that you clearly work with, you know, they're selling a product. So yeah, they're hitting mass scale, but it's less personal one-to-one -one relationship. It's more about how do I service the mass market? And so- yeah. It, you know that it makes sense for someone like you to be in a space like that you know building relationships and doing it you know in my opinion very effortlessly um it makes sense and it's also why I've, i find myself gravitating toward the same things too yeah well look there's a lot of part of it that, that suck you know as you know right like you gotta you've got a staff ahead of growth which means you're always investing out of your ca your cash um you know uh, it's almost impossible to avoid your payroll creeping up like nobody's business. And, and, you know, you've got to, you've got to protect your gross margin. Like it's like it's gold, right? Otherwise, you know, you just, you just can't serve the client base. Right. And so, you know, I think that, uh, you know, the biggest challenges, and I know this is mostly for sellers, um, but for small agencies, service providers that could be listening, the, the challenge really is, 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 staying really committed to working with the right kinds of clients um, because, you know, nothing will do you in faster than selling your services for under market value. Uh, as soon as you get busy, you're done. Like, you know, every time you go to take a client on, you got to fire a couple that you took at lower rates. It's just, it's just bad. So it's, you've got to have that right metric from the beginning, you know, and that's, that's, easily transferable over to the product side and in, in relationship to, you know, how you're pricing your products, right? You know, other than getting ranked, doesn't do you a lot of good to sell a bunch of stuff where you're not making money. You're not going to have money for your next inventory run. Yeah, that's great advice. That's great advice for anyone that's in the service business and even product, you know, product related. That That's always the challenge, right? It's how do I 
bring intrinsic value and be paid accordingly for it and stay ahead of the curve because yeah i mean head you know head count stacks up quicker than you realize and you always Fast. want to be over delivering and under promising and yeah i mean sure particularly in escala have we had some shitty clients that i wish we never took on because we we saw an opportunity of course it's part of business but you 100%. Know, what you fail to realize is when you take that on and then you get the rush that you were hoping to get and then you can charge clients a fair price and these are clients that you actually want to work with because they're partners they don't see you as a service provider you've you know you've totally inhibited your ability to grow in a direction that actually makes sense to the business and you're tarnishing your brand at the same time so being calculated making yeah. those decisions i mean it's it should be the lifeblood of any successful uh, agency or service-based business yeah. for sure. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I feel like, I feel like with all of the experiences you've had, there's probably a few key things that you'd likely avoid moving forward. You know, when it comes to lessons learned throughout it, I mean, you know, I know I'm putting you on the spot here, but uh, some of the things, or what are some of the things that throughout your experience in all the businesses that you've built, like, what are the things that you've learned not to fall into the trap of each time? Mm. Yeah, I, I'd like to say that I've, I, I've not repeated any of these key mistakes, but I, I'm not sure you always get the lesson the first time, right? Yeah. Um, that's just life, right? Like you know, the first lesson is like a little tack hammer and then it moves up to like a, you know, a regular hammer and then you know, third or fourth time you, you do the same dumb shit, you get smacked by a sledgehammer, right? So... Uh, I think, I think a couple of things, I think, um, and this is, I think this is related to any, any business, right? So I think backing up to what you said, did you, was this company born out of this vision or did just, you know, I think really getting clear on that vision that then the culture kind of comes out of um, allows you to get really clear on what you will and won't do right? Um, the kind of people you will and won't work with. Uh, and this could be clients, this could be vendors, uh, you know, because if you're, a, you know, an e-commerce business owner, you have to have vendors that you work with, you have to have things of the business that you're outsourced. Um, even if you do everything yourself, right, then but you still have your accountants, and you're this and you're that you still have, everyone needs people. So I think getting clear on that so that uh, when you're looking for someone, like it's either a hell yes or a hell no. I think that's super, super important. Um, and I think uh, before you even start talking to those people, get really clear in our, in our minds and build out the actual processes for whatever that, that partner or vendor is so that the expectations are really clear. I think it's, um, and I know this is your world, right? But I think, you know, especially entrepreneurs that are really great at build, building and scaling business, like sometimes we suck at the process part um, because it's just a level of detail that that is just a different part of our brain. Um, I, how many, I mean, how often do you hear, you know, someone can do something really well, but then they can't actually teach someone how to, you know, teach someone else how to do it. So I think, you know, uh, getting clear on your pro getting your processes clear, getting your vision and culture and, you know, kind of belief systems and, you know, here's what we're this business is going to be about. I think it's just really key because you attract the, the people that you want to play with long-term, you know, uh, you know, you avoid massive turnover and turnover is expensive and time consuming and, and a big pain in the ass. Right. And, um, and I think, on the agency side of life right now with, you know, the, just the hundreds of aggregators that have started that weren't even around two and a half years ago, uh, this, the, 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 the demand for talent in this space is at an all time high. And this is going to affect agencies, consultants, independent product owners, like that want to just um, outsource bits of their work, not necessarily go with an agency, but outsource to like the age. That, that pull on talent, like it's a great opportunity for a business like yours. And it's a huge, it's both an opportunity and a huge threat to, to other people in the industry. 
I mean, you know, on that point around talent, there's a, I literally put a presentation together and it's an amazing book, uh, Who? The A Method of Hiring. And it's how we actually run um, a bunch of the way in which we approach hiring. Um, so the true cost of, uh, of an employee or a bad hire is 15 times their base salary in this study. So you bring in a hundred thousand dollar employee. That's one point five million down the drain right there. That's painful. And now I looked. I found this stat where I was trying to put this presentation together for Helium Tens Elite Sellers and a bunch of other communities. And what I found was that there's been a three hundred and thirty five percent rise in e commerce uh, like focused roles over the last five years. And that's not even equating in the last sort of. 12 months of what's happened. So you are just going to struggle when, you know, there is just a massive demand and a massive undersupply when it comes to anything related to e-commerce talent. And so for sure, I mean, to your point, building the processes, enabling your way in which you can actually approach it is, you know, it's fundamental to seeing the the results. And I'm loving your dog. And that's not my dog. That's for once jumping up on me and, uh, <laughs> and she's mm-hmm. asleep on the couch. I don't know if you can see in the mirror there. Yeah, no. Oh, uh, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. She's great. So she blends in, but yeah, I mean, spot yeah. on. I think, I think that both all three of those points uh, are great. So how do you actually build solutions where talent, you effectively have to build talent in-house. Like how we approach all this is that we have those A players that we bring into the business. We leverage, I mean, we're obviously in a fortunate position having a consultancy focused on process improvement where we then document out all of the expert level knowledge and build a process so that we build our own sort of internal training curriculum to enable growth. Well, that's, I think you've nailed it. You have to, right? So, um, you know, you've got to you've got to have really tight internal processes and and uh, protocols for how you do things, um, because if you if you don't, then someone with less experience uh, is is just going to fumble around, right? So I think that's number one. You got to build the internal processes nice and tight, uh, and you know I think. When you get a senior person, you know, you just have to work with them on that, uh, on really buttoning up the, the training process uh, for new hires, right? So, so that you can potentially hire someone that's not an A player, right? Because the pool of A players, they're snapped up like that, right? Um, I would say that the average salary for an A player in this space is, it's got to be up 20 to 30% this year. Even more, um, I've heard. I've heard as much as sixty percent. Like you're getting entry level people in Amazon PPC roles uh, for for eighty five k starting salary. Wild. That's just fucking retarded, Re- right? It's right. Just retarded. It's just retarded. So you know, um, you know, and some of the big aggregators aren't are, aren't paying all that well, but they they've got the excitement of raising you know hundreds of millions of dollars and. You know, it's the the startup culture of like Silicon Valley, and so there's other bells and whistles that you know that they can can dangle, right? Um, look, I think there's a there's a person that's the right fit for every seat in the industry, right? So like, there's there's people that would love to go work at like the thrashes of the world, right, and be in that kind of growth culture, and there's other people that would hate that. Just like your your employee number is 137 this month, right? Like, you know, I, I read a post by uh, oh, I'm trying to think the head of their M and A. Um, uh, he was doing a, a, a you know a new hire welcome training for 500 people, right? It's crazy. So a lot of people would hate that, right? But there's people that would love that, right? And so and then on the flip side of it, like. We hire a senior person, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting fit because they're going to get paid from a, from a relation standpoint, a much, much higher percentage of like our overall revenue than they would at a big agency, you know, or, or a big aggregator. Um, And, and for the right person, that means a lot, right? Like, you know, you're, Hey, I'm, you're good, 
I want to grow with you. It's more of almost like a partnership, right? Yep. Even though they might not be uh, equity. Um, and, uh, and then for the right person, that's a great fit. Like, you know, do they want to be a big fish in a, in a smaller pond or a small fish in a big ass pond? And everyone's different, right? So, you know, uh, anyway, so it's just that's we can talk no, you, about that you, forever, but for sure, for sure. And I, I, like I said, you, you bring up some really great points on sort of the different challenges that everyone's going to face. And, you know, like you said, finding the right talent that fits, like, where we we're big traction folks over here. So like, you know, GWC gets it, wants it, and is capable. Yeah. You know, finding the right yeah. people, putting them in the right seats is really key. But man, I'm just looking up and I'm seeing that we're really getting to the top of the hour here. So before I let you leave, I'd love you to tell anyone listening in how they might get in touch with you, page one, or uh, however you might sure. want to be contacted, mate. Yeah, I'm mean, so, you know, for any agency work, whether it's product photography, design, storefront, video, brand management, all that kind of good stuff, um, best is just go to the site and it's page dot one. So there's no dot com. Pretty sure if you search page one dot com, we're first search result anyway, but uh, it's page dot one. Uh, if you wanted to talk to me personally, I do almost all of my business networking through LinkedIn. Uh, and it's just LinkedIn, uh, whatever that URL thread is, Keith B. O'Brien. Um, and that's the best place to uh, put a little note in that you heard me on this podcast and reference Yoni. And uh, so that, you know, I know who you are when you do a request. That would be great. There but, you go. There you go, guys. Getting yeah. some, some special treatment right there. Well, mate, Keith. Thanks, thanks a lot, seriously, for coming on and having having a chat. I wish we could do another hour here, but uh, got the. I, I'm stupid. Didn't didn't book in any buffer between now and the next call. So, mate, again, no worries, man. it's it's it been happens. awesome, and and thank you so much. Yeah, likewise, appreciate it. Um, congrats on all of your transitions, and sucks that you didn't get paid out of that cell, but uh, it sounds like you've scaled up pretty well in the last couple of years. Definitely. You know what? At the end of the day, I'm much happier doing this than what I was there. And I think, you know, there as you a go. baseline, it'll pay off in the long run. 